You can go ahead and get started there, Cameron. All right, folks, it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Moira McLaughlin, Everly Family Distinguished Professor of Physics and Astronomy at West Virginia University. Uh, Moira did her, her, her uh, bachelor's at Penn State University and her PhD with Jim Cordes at Cornell in 2001. Um, she went on to a postdoc at John R. Bank and from there to WVU where she has been ever since. I think it's fair to say that Moore's passion is all things pulsars and her work has spanned the full uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, she's led definitive papers on the gamma ray pulsar population and uh, discovered uh, new populations at radio wavelengths, including her famous work on rotating radio transients, uh, rats or, or rats, I still, I'm still always confused which to call them. Um, I say rats. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you say rats, then they're rats. That's what I, I, I meant to ask you that, actually. Um, these are pulsar-like sources with occasional uh, single pulse emission with an underlying periodicity. Um, and I think it's fair to say she's also a pioneer in the, in the, in the, in the, in the field of FRBs, which, of course, is a very uh, hot field right now. Um, I think there's a direct line from Mora's pioneering work in the search for giant pulses um, from new stars and other galaxies nearby, our Milky Way in a paper in 2003. The discovery of FRBs happened serendipitously a few years later in a very similar search and Moore was part of that team and um, uh, and has been involved in FRBs ever since and that of course is a huge and evolved, rapidly evolving field. I think though her biggest passion ha has been the use of pulsars as precise clocks uh, to detect gravitational waves at nanohertz frequencies. So much lower frequencies than we we, then locally is used for, for LIGO or LISA when it launches. And, and Mora was one of the founding members of the North American uh, Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, or Nanograv, and has played a leading role in uh, since its inception, inception in 2007. And I think there's more than 100 scientists now part of Nanograv. Um, Mora has been chair in, uh, of Nanograv and is currently co-chair of the Nanograv's Physics Frontier Center. And uh, uh, we're very lucky to, to hear some exciting results from Nanograv today. So please, Mora, take it away. Thank you for that very nice introduction, Greg. Um, and it's really nice to see some familiar names. Um, I wish I could be visiting in person. That would be more fun, but someday. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to tell you about some recent results from the Nanograph collaboration um, from our 12 and a half year data set, which I know is an odd um, uh, breakdown for a data set, but I'll explain a little bit about why that is. Um, and the title of this talk is Knocking at the Gravitational Wave Door, um, because we have some recent and very tantalizing results um, that are indicative of us, of us, not a gravitational wave detection yet, um, but we see signatures in our data that are consistent with gravitational waves. So in this talk, I'll give some background on pulsar timing, on gravitational waves, on how we do our analysis, and I'll present our recent results. And then I'll talk about what the future looks like, what we expect from the next few years. And before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about nanograph. So as Greg said, Nanograph stands for the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. We're a collaboration of students and scientists in the US and Canada, hence the, the North American. Um, we are attempting to characterize the universe at low gravitational wave frequencies, hence the nanohertz. Um, we're an NSF Physics Frontier Center. Um, we've been a Physics Frontier Center since March, 2015. And just yesterday, um, we got funded for the next five years. So our Physics Frontier Center has now been renewed um, for another five years, which we are incredibly grateful for and super excited about. Um, and I'll just mention, you know, that we're very open to new members. Um, we're very open to people popping into our meetings, um, seeing what we're all about, um, seeing if there's some way, you know, you get it, you want to get involved. So if you're interested, um, feel free to send me an email, go to our website, um, check out the next meeting. Um, all the logos of the institutions that are part of Nanograv are on this slide. And of course, you can see Caltech is right there in the upper left. Um, and I just want to say right now that, you know, Caltech faculty, postdocs and students have been absolutely critical to the efforts of Nanograv over the past decade. Um, and they're also a very important part of our next PFC. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through this talk. Okay. I want to also mention that we are part of a larger international collaboration. I'm not going to talk too much about IPTA work in this colloquium, um, but the IPTA is a collaboration of Nanograv and then colleagues in Europe and Australia, and very recently in India. The Indian Pulsar Timing Array just recently joined this collaboration about a month ago. Um, this diagram here shows all the telescopes that are part of the IPTA. 
Um, the ones in orange are new telescopes that are just starting to contribute data to this effort. So this is really exciting. Um, this effort is expanding to include 16 telescopes um, in 11 countries, actually 15, because I did not take Arecibo out. So that's kind of a sad footnote. So it's only 15 telescopes. Um, okay. So let me just give you like a super big picture of the motivation um, for the nanograph experiment. So this is a little cartoon which shows the um, history of galaxy formation. And in this standard hierarchical picture, galaxies are formed small um, and kind of disordered. And then in time, they grow larger and more ordered through mergers with other galaxies. And of course, we can see evidence for this electromagnetically when galaxies are you know, separated as in this image here. Um, but once a galaxy merges and the two black holes are at separations, you know, less than a parsec, um, we're not able to resolve those two galaxies electromagnetically, and we can't tell whether a particular galaxy is a product of the merger, and we can't see the physics, you know, that is, that's bringing those galaxies, those black holes together um, at very small separations with orbital periods of years. Um, and this physics is very important to understand, it will tell us a lot about this picture of galaxy evolution and formation over cosmic time. So what we want to do with nanograv is detect supermassive black holes um, at the cores of galaxies that have merged. So when we're in this very close separation stage, and there's really no other way to do this than through gravitational waves. I don't think I need to tell an audience at Caltech where gravitational waves are, but just in case, here's one slide. So gravitational waves are ripples in space time. They're predicted by general relativity. Um, we know they're produced by massive accelerating objects like pairs of black holes. Um, they travel at the speed of light. And of course, they carry energy away from binary systems, bringing the objects and the binaries together and eventually resulting in their merger. Okay, um, just one slide about gravitational wave detection. So our experiment works much the same way that LIGO works. Um, we're looking for quadrupolar distortions in the light travel time between the Earth and pulsars, um, much like LIGO is looking for changes in the path length of lasers. Um, you know, if a gravitational wave was going through this screen, we would see quadrupolar distortions in the distances between these point masses like this. There's two polarizations, a plus and cross polarization. This doesn't really matter too much um, for the experiment that we're doing. Okay, so you might have heard that LIGO has already detected gravitational waves. Um, of course, Caltech has played an amazing role in this. I'm not gonna go into LIGO much at all, but just to say it's, it's astounding. Um, and the amount that we have learned about black holes and general relativity over the past five years has just, just really been remarkable and just so exciting. Um, Nanograv is playing a very complementary role to LIGO. So this is the standard um, frequency strain plot that we show to illustrate Nanograv's role in the gravitational wave spectrum. So LIGO, of course, is sensitive to gravitational waves with very high frequencies, you know, tens to hundreds of Hertz. And Nanograv sits way down here. So we are sensitive to gravitational wave frequencies of like 10 to the minus six um, to 10 to the minus nine Hertz or so. So we're talking binaries with orbital periods of years to decades. Um, I'm going to talk more about the sources of gravitational waves, so I won't discuss these um, right now. I, I'll come back to these sensitivity curves later, but I just wanted to show um, that we play a complementary role to LIGO and LISA. Um, and so LIGO is sensitive to stellar mass binaries, as you know, and as we get down to nanograv frequencies, we're looking at supermassive binaries. So like, you know, billions of solar mass binaries. So very different types of sources. Okay, so that's sort of like the big picture overview of the experiment. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about pulsars now and pulsar timing. Um, so pulsars are neutron stars, they're born in supernova explosions. Um, when we talk about pulsar timing arrays, we're talking about a network of pulsars distributed across the sky that we observe together, not necessarily simultaneously at exactly the same time, but around the same time. And we look for correlations and the arrival times of pulses from this network of pulsars um, from all the members of the array. And you can use PTAs for, for lots of different experiments, actually. You know, they can serve as a celestial time standard. Um, but the only experiment I'm going to talk about here is searching for gravitational waves um, using pulsar timing arrays. And let me just play. 
I can't get get through a cloak in without pay, playing at least one video um, of a rotating pulsar. Um, the reason that pulsars are so fantastic for this experiment is that they are incredibly stable rotators. And we can predict with very high precision when the next pulse from a particular pulsar is going to arrive. We can do this particularly well for pulsars that are called millisecond pulsars. So millisecond pulsars are the very fastest rotating pulsars. Um, they have millisecond periods, as you might guess from their names. Um, so we generally classify MSPs as pulsars with spin periods of like one to tens of milliseconds. Um, in our galaxy, there are about 340 of these MSPs right now. Um, that's a tiny fraction out of the total number that are detectable. So there's a lot of discovery space that we could observe with like bigger telescopes. Um, of these 340 millisecond pulsars, about 100 of them are currently being timed by this international effort. Um, the reason they're not all timed is that many of them are just too far away, they're really faint, um, or they're like in messy binaries that have eclipses and things that, that are just not very good for high precision timing. If you look at this ATOF plot here, this, whoops, oh, there's my cursor, okay. Um, this shows the galactic plane. This is the north and south galactic pole. And you can see all the millisecond pulsars here. The red ones are the ones that, ones that are being timed by pulsar timing array experiments. And the reason I wanted to show this is just to show that these MSPs have a fairly isotropic distribution on the sky, um, much more isotropic than normal pulsars, um, which generally are confined to the plane of the galaxy. And this is a really nice property for gravitational wave experiments, having this large like angular um, sky distribution. And this plot over here shows period versus period derivative for the pulsar population. Um, and I just wanted to point out the pulsars that we're using for these experiments are these guys down in the lower left-hand corner of this plot. So these are objects that have very short spin periods and very small period derivatives. That means they're losing energy very, very, very slowly. And these are pulsars that have been recycled. Um, they've been born up in this part of the diagram with high magnetic fields, maybe periods of tens of milliseconds. Um, and as they age, they've moved into this part of the diagram. And then eventually their companion star evolves, um, fills its Roche lobe, material accretes onto the pulsar and spins it up to these millisecond periods. So most of our pulsars that we're using for this pulsar timing experiment are actually in binary systems with white dwarfs because they've been recycled through this process. Okay, um, this is a very simple little cartoon that just illustrates what we do when we time a pulsar. Um, so we have our pulsar, we've got our radio telescope, um, we observe at some particular radio frequency, um, we actually need to observe over either a very wide radio bandwidth or at two separate frequencies um, because we need to de-disperse the radio signals. This means we need to correct for the frequency dependent time delays that the signal experiences as it travels through the interstellar medium. Another really important thing that we do um, when we time pulsars is we take all of the data we collect on a particular pulsar over a time span of like 20 to 30 minutes typically, and we add up all the pulses from each rotation, one on top of the other. Um, and this is because pulsars are actually very faint. Um, for most of these millisecond pulsars, we can't actually detect a single pulse. We can only detect them when we sum up many, many pulses. So we observe a pulsar, say once every week to once every month um, for something like a half hour. We add up all the pulses over that half hour to calculate what we call a pulse profile. And so here's a, a cartoon version of one of our pulse profiles. And what we want to calculate is the time of arrival or the TOA of that pulse profile at a particular epoch at our telescope, right? And of course we have a very accurate atomic clock at the observatory, um, which tells us exactly when a particular pulse arrived at a particular epoch. And so this is what we do with pulsar timing. We wanna accumulate as many times of arrival from a sample of pulsars in this pulsar timing array as possible. Okay. Now that sounds simple, um, but of course there are many, many things that affect these arrival times aside from gravitational waves. Um, and all of these other things are much, much larger effects than what we're looking for when we search for gravitational waves. Um, some of these things are intrinsic to the pulsar. Obviously we need to fit out the rotation period of the pulsar, um, we need to account for its period derivative or the rate of change of that period. As I mentioned before, most of our pulsars are in binary systems. So we need to characterize the binary orbit 
because that's going to cause Doppler shifts to the pulsar period as the pulsar moves around its companion. We need to correct for time delays due to the interstellar medium. And those are gonna change with time also, right? Because the earth is moving, the pulsar is moving, the interstellar medium is moving. So we need to monitor these delays um, with time and correct for them. And then of course, um, because the earth is moving around the sun, we're sensitive to the pulsar's position. Um, we're sensitive to proper motion and parallax. And we even have a contribution due to the solar electron density. These dispersion measures have a contribution um, due to the, the solar wind. So we need to have a very complex model um, that fits out all these other effects before we can search for gravitational waves. Um, and I don't expect you to read all of these things or read all these numbers right now, but I just wanted to like throw up an example pulsar timing model just so you can see what one of our models looks like. Um, so we have astrometric parameters, of course. This is the spin frequency of a particular pulsar, um, my favorite pulsar, 1713 plus 0747. It's one we've been timing for, for a very long time. Um, this is the spin frequency um, at a particular epoch. And you can see we measure this with just amazing precision. So 218.811843854725.0 hertz. And, and we really know that um, down to that very last significant digit here. Um, we measure a spin down rate, we measure astrometric parameters, right ascension, declination, proper motion, parallax, and we have to worry about the interstellar medium with this dispersion measure. This pulsar is in a binary with a white dwarf with a period of about 67 days. We need to characterize the orbit. Um, we need to account for effects due to the pulse profile not being the same at every frequency that we observe at, so we need to account for that evolution. So we have models like this that we create um, for every pulsar. And there are actually many more parameters that are shown here um, because this dispersion measure, we actually model on every single day that we observe. So at the bottom of a file that has the, these parameters, we'll have another you know, hundreds of lines with different, different dispersion measures. So once we have one of these models, then what we actually analyze to search for gravitational waves are what we call timing residuals. And the residuals are just what they sound like. They're the differences between when our model predicts the pulses should arrive and when the pulses actually arrived. Um, and a very important word here, of course, is barycentric TOAs. Um, one very critical part of this entire process is referencing the times of arrival to the solar system barycenter. So removing that motion of the earth around the sun. Okay, and so once we do that, we end up with residuals that look something like this. Um, this is for this same pulsar in the um, previous slide. These are data over about 20 years. Um, and the different colors are different telescope backend combinations. So these blue points here are from Arecibo. Um, these black points at the end here are also from Arecibo. And you can see, even though the telescope did not change, the telescope remained the same size. Our instrumentation has gotten much, much better with time. Um, in particular, the bandwidths we've, we've observed over have gotten much, much larger. So the error bars on these residuals have gone way down with time. Um, the things starting with G are green bank data. Um, so these um, red points here have exactly the same back end as the black points. They're called guppy and puppy for green bank um, in Puerto Rico. This is, this is the ultimate pulsar processing instrument. Um, and anyway, you can really see how important collecting area is to our experiment. Um, the Arecibo points are much, much smaller. But the point of showing this is just to illustrate that we can time pulsars over time spans of decades. Um, this pulsar has a spin period of around four and a half milliseconds. And we quantify how well we can time a pulsar by the root mean square of these residuals. And for this pulsar, it's about 70 nanoseconds. Um, so that's pretty good. This is kind of like state of the art in pulsar timing. Tens of nanoseconds is the, the best we're doing for any pulsar. Okay. Um, so I've talked about kind of like determined um, effects on the TOA. So things that we can model exactly like proper motion or binary motion. Um, there are of course other sources of noise and pulsar timing data um, that aren't deterministic. So some of these things are intrinsic to the pulsar. Um, for instance, pulsars are not perfect rotators. Um, they have some rotational irregularities which we call timing noise. Um, pulses jitter, every single pulse does not get emitted at exactly the same phase. They actually jump around in phase a bit. That's a source of noise. Um, there are extrinsic sources of noises like scattering through the interstellar medium. 
Planetary ephemerides, um, they're not perfect. If there are an ephemerides that produces a source of noise and we could have like clock offsets at observatories, right? The clock could just have some, some small error at some particular epoch. Um, so what we do in Nanograv is we model all these different sources of noise. And fortunately, they have different characteristics. So um, most of them are achromatic. They don't depend on radio frequency, aside from the ISM stuff. Um, most of them are correlated in time, aside from this pulse jitter. Um, and only one of these sources of noise is correlated in space, these planetary ephemerides. Um, the rest of these we'd expect to be independent of kind of where a pulsar sits in the sky. So we model all these different sources of noise um, in a Bayesian fashion um, to determine the different contributions to the noise for each individual pulsar. So that's pulsars, that's sort of the pulsar introduction. Um, and now I wanna talk a little bit about gravitational waves um, and how they look in our pulsar timing data. And then after that, I will move on and put it all together and tell you about our most recent nanograv results. Okay, I'm just looking at the time. Okay. Um, so here's a very um, simple cartoon that really gets across the idea of what we're trying to do. Um, this was actually made by Don Backer um, many years ago, who's you know, the founding father of this field. Um, this is a black hole binary. And here are two pulsars that are sitting in the distorted space time um, due to the gravitational waves emitted by this black hole binary. Here's our telescope. And you can see from looking at this very simple cartoon um, that the light travel time between pulsar two and the telescope and pulsar one and the telescope is going to be affected by the gravitational waves. And in different ways, depending on the orientation between the gravitational wave source and the pulsar and the telescope. Um, some kind of big picture numbers about our experiment. So the frequencies that we're sensitive to, the gravitational wave frequencies, are gonna be roughly like one over the minimum cadence of our observations, which is something like weeks, um, to the total time span, which is years. Right now it's at about 16 years. Um, so this is where this 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus nine Hertz sensitivity range comes from. The residual that we detect due to a gravitational wave source um, it's gonna be proportional to the strain of the gravitational wave source um, over the frequency of that source. So this is one of our F term. Um, and that's really important because it means that as we get to longer and longer time spans and we're sensitive to lower and lower frequency gravitational waves, the induced residuals are larger. So we kind of like automatically get more sensitive with time. The residual that we observe has two terms, a pulsar term and an earth term. Um, so we need to worry about what the gravitational wave source looked like at the pulsar um, when that pulse was emitted and at the Earth when we received that pulse. We have two terms to this perturbation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and what that looks like um, in a few slides. Um, so if we want like just a really basic number for what our minimum detectable strains are, we can kind of turn this little equation around and we can say it's going to be roughly the precision at which we can time the pulsars. Um, over the total time span. So if we can time pulsars with about 200 nanosecond precision, and this is approximately the average RMS for the pulsars in the nanograv array, um, and we do that for a decade, that's like 10 to the minus 15. Um, so that's where this sensitivity comes from. You know, that's why these sit at around 10 to the minus 15 over here. Um, one thing I just wanna point out is that the wavelengths of the gravitational waves we're sensitive to are very small compared to the distances between us and the pulsar. So like, unlike LIGO, where the whole arm is getting stretched and squeezed when a gravitational wave passes through, we have many, many, many gravitational wave wavelengths in between us and the pulsar, um, which is why we have this pulsar term and this earth term um, that we need to worry about. And there can be significant evolution between those, those two terms. Um, this is the standard sort of sensitivity curve um, this is kind of heuristic. Don't take exact the placement of this <laughs> too seriously. Um, but our sensitivity curve looks kind of V-shaped um, in a similar way to LIGO curves. Um, and the way to understand that is that as we get to frequencies that are less than one over our total time span, we would just fit those perturbations out in our timing data. Um, as we get to higher frequencies up here, we're seeing this one over F effect. And you'll notice a big jump at exactly one over a year. We're just not sensitive to exactly one year frequencies because we would fit them out when we fit for positions and proper motions, um, which have a, a yearly dependence. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our gravitational wave sources. Um, so like LIGO, 
we think our most likely sources are going to be binary systems. Um, but binary systems that are much, much more massive than those that LIGO has detected. Um, we can, of course, predict the strain of a particular binary system um, for a 10 to the 8 solar mass binary with an orbital period of a year at around a giga light year. Um, this Q is the mass ratio. That gives us a strain of around 10 to the minus 17. Um, so you might notice 10 to the minus 17 is a lot smaller than 10 to the minus 15. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and another really important thing to remember is the time to merger. So the strains are obviously going to be um, higher for more massive systems with shorter orbital periods, but those systems are going to merge a lot more quickly too. Um, so one type of source we search for are continuous wave sources. This is what we would call you know, the signal from a, a single binary. Um, these will look like sine waves in our data. Um, our spans are short enough that we can treat them as non-evolving um, sine waves in our timing residuals. Um, we're also sensitive to burst sources, um, which would look like a step function in our residuals. So this would be um, a burst produced by a, by a merger event. It would look something like this um, in our timing residuals. And what I'm going to talk most about today, though, is the signature from the stochastic background. Um, so this is the background due to the superposition of all of the gravitational waves produced by all the merging supermassive binary black holes in the universe. Um, we expect that spectrum to have a power law form. So it'll look something like this. And we expect this power law index to be negative. Um, so what this means is that even though the objects with higher orbital frequencies will have larger strains, they're going to merge much more rapidly. So our spectrum is actually dominated um, by the lowest frequency or the longest orbital period objects. We expect that spectrum to be something like minus two thirds. Um, this has you know, kind of simplistic assumptions. So when we actually measure this, it'll be really interesting to see how much it deviates from this number. And this will tell us a lot about the assumptions that, that go into this calculation. Um, oh, I didn't mention this image. This is just a nice um, Chandra image of this X-shaped, um, these X-shaped jets coming from a merging galaxy. And it's just meant to show that there's a lot of observational evidence um, that there are systems like this out there in the universe um, for us to detect. So let's talk a little bit more about the stochastic background and how we hope to detect it in our data. Um, so we expect the stochastic background um, to affect all of the pulsars in our pulsar timing array. Um, and we expect a correlation that looks like this plot on the right here. So this is called the Hellings and Downs correlation function. And this shows what we would expect um, if we take residuals from pairs of pulsars and we correlate them with each other. And then we plot that correlation coefficient as a function of the angle between the pulsars. So pulsars in the same direction of the sky will show correlated perturbations. Um, if they're separated by roughly 90 degrees, they're going to show anti-correlated perturbations. And at 180 degrees, we expect to see correlated perturbations again. Um, this exact shape is a little complex to arrive at. One needs to average over an isotropic distribution um, of lots of galaxies. But I think this very simple quadrupolar um, fashion is, is easy to understand just by looking at how gravitational waves perturb space-time. And the very nice thing about this correlated function that we're searching for in our data um, is that if we see this exact quadrupolar correlation, it's very difficult to um, produce that um, in another way, right? So if we had mistakes like a clocker at the observatory, for instance, um, that would be monopolar. We wouldn't expect any kind of like angular correlation. Um, if we have ephemeris errors due to say we have a mass of Jupiter wrong, that would be dipolar. Um, pulsars at 180 degrees would show an anti-correlation. Um, and gravitational waves are really the only thing that will produce this, this quadrupolar co correlation. So this is a very elegant experiment um, to search for the signature in our data. Okay, and I'm just gonna go back to this noise plot. So this is the same thing that I showed before, um, but with another row added for the gravitational wave background. Um, so the gravitational wave background will appear as a source of noise in our data, just like all these other sources of noise. Um, and it will share some properties in common with some of these other sources of noise. Um, but it is the only noise source that is achromatic, correlated in time, correlated in space, and quadrupolar. Um, so this shows that we can distinguish gravitational waves from other sources of noise. And of course, the one that is most similar 
um, would be an error in a planetary ephemeris. And um, I will come to this fairly shortly when I talk about our results. Let me just show this movie before we move on to talking about the nanograph results. This is sort of like just a big picture um, illustration of what we're trying to do. If anyone is a graphical graphic artist or an animator and wants to make us a better animation, that would be really nice. We, we really need a new one of these. Um, but this shows two galaxies coming together. The black holes at their cores are in the process of merging. They're producing gravitational waves. These gravitational waves are traveling through the universe. And, and one really important point that I'm not sure if I, I made well enough is that the pulsars we're observing are all in our own galaxy. They're all in the Milky Way, um, only you know, a kiloparsec away in most cases. And the galaxies that we are detecting gravitational waves from are, of course, cosmological. You know, they're at gigaparsec distances. And as these gravitational waves pass in between the pulsar and the Earth, um, they basically redshift and blue shift the um, apparent frequency or apparent spin period of the pulsar um, with the period of those waves. And so it's this kind of effect that we're looking for um, with a radio telescope on Earth. I wish someone would build us a telescope as big as this. That would be really great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about our nanograph results now. Um, so up until August 2020, um, when Arecibo had its um, cable failure, we were observing about 80 millisecond pulsars. Um, and our primary telescopes were the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico um, and the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. We did roughly half the pulsars um, at each telescope. Some of them we did every week. Um, most of them we did every month. Um, we observe each pulsar for something like 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and at each telescope, we use two separate frequencies, um, one at around 800 megahertz um, or a gigahertz, and one at around one to, to three gigahertz, depending on the particular pulsar. But these two separate frequencies are really important to correct for dispersive effects in the interstellar medium. We also have a small program using the Very Large Array in New Mexico. Um, we time seven millisecond pulsars there. Um, this shows the distribution of the pulsars we time. Um, this gray line here is the galactic plane, of course, and you can see we, we, a lot of the pulsars are kind of scattered along the galactic plane, but we have a fair number um, elsewhere. And one really important goal is to kind of fill out some of these empty bits in our sky coverage um, we can't see anything at less than minus 45 degrees in declination. That's where our IPTA partners come in. Um, I'm sure all of you know the story, and that is that we no longer have Arecibo. Um, sadly, we never were able to use, again, use it again after that August cable failure. Um, and in December, um, it, as I'm sure you know, um, the platform collapsed into the dish. Um, so this has been a significant source of stress for us. Um, we have 16 years of beautiful Arecibo data um, on a number of millisecond pulsars. And that timeline was just um, cut. You know, the baseline of timing data that we have with Arecibo is no more. Um, for the past six months or so, it's been six months, not quite six months, four months, I guess. Um, well, no, since August, it's actually more, it's like eight months. Yeah, so, so for the past eight months or so, um, we've been carrying out like a GBT only program um, with a little bit of supplement from the VLA. Um, because we just didn't have any more time on the GBT to pick up those Arecibo pulsars. Um, so we've actually have a, have a pretty big gap now um, in the data on the Arecibo pulsars. Um, that went to about a month ago. And then about a month ago, we got more time on the GBT. Um, so we've been able to add some of the Arecibo pulsars to the GBT program. So now we're at about 60, but not all, all of them. Some of them are just too faint. Um, and we've also started supplementing our data with CHIME data. So this is the CHIME telescope in Canada. Um, so we've dropped some of the low frequency green bank observations um, and we're using chime data for those pulsars um, to replace that low frequency arm and that's allowed us to add some arecibo pulsars back in that's probably more detail than many of you uh, want to hear but that's what we're doing right now um, we're hoping with time to be able to find funding to purchase more gbt time to get our, our full observing program back um, we really hope we can do that so the way that we work is we release data um, every few years. So, you know, we build up some subset of data, um, we carry out a timing analysis on it, and then we release it to the community along with another gravitational wave analysis. Our most recent data set that we released was the 12 and a half year data set. 
Um, this is the one that I'm going to talk about. And this plot shows the pulsars in our data set over here. Um, and this is time from 2004 till now. The different colors are different telescope frequency combinations. Um, the thing to notice is just that we've been adding many more pulsars with time. So with time, the number of pulsars has grown. Um, the cadence of our observations or how frequently we observe the pulsars um, has also increased by a lot. Um, these lines look more solid now than they did back at the beginning. Um, and so each data set is more sensitive than the one before. And if you're curious about our data, it's all publicly available. You can go to data.nanograph.org and you can download our most recent 12 and a half year data set. Um, our next data set is going to be the 15 year data set. Um, and you can see we're going to add a number of new pulsars to that data set and extend the time baseline by two and a half years. So we're, we're very excited for this next data set because it should be a dramatic boost in sensitivity compared to the 12 and a half year. And I just want to point out that these data releases are useful for many things aside from just um, gravitational wave detection. So you can download very, very high sensitivity pulse profiles um, like these, which carry a lot of information about pulsar emission physics. Um, you can get the actual times of arrival, which look like this. They're just ASCII files um, with times of arrival. These are in modified Julian date um, with errors and telescope tags. You can download these. And you can also download parameters for particular pulsars, um, which have a lot of astrophysics in them um, on proper motions, binaries, things like that. This particular pulsar, 0740, is one of our most interesting um, secondary science results over the past year um, because it ends up to have a quite large mass um, over two solar masses. Um, still has a fairly large error bar, which will decrease with time, but right now it's setting the most stringent constraints on the neutron star equation of state. So this shows mass versus neutron star radius, and all these lines are different equations of state, and you can see that it, it rules out um, quite a few equations of state. So that's, that's pretty exciting. And we hope to produce a lot more results like this um, as we accumulate more data. So these are some timing residuals. Um, this is what the data look like that we analyze. Um, and again, these residuals are the differences between our model times of arrival. So when our timing model tells us the pulse should arrive on a particular day and when it actually arrives. Um, the units of these are microseconds. And so you can see that in general, we're like below a microsecond for these three pulsars. Different colors or different frequency data. Um, these dotted lines um, are when we switch to better backends. So you can see the error bars go down um, after these dotted lines. Um, and you can also see how much more frequently we're observing now. So these residuals are messy. Um, there are occasionally things that we don't understand. These are probably interstellar medium related events that we're not correcting for optimally. But the important thing is that we cross correlate the residuals at every pulsar with every other pulsar in the array. And then we look for this very special spatially correlated signature in our data. Um, and this is what we expect due to a stochastic background. This will look like correlated red noise in our data. When we search for single sources, we're basically searching for sine waves um, in these data, but also showing a particular correlated pattern across the sky um, or step functions, which you would expect due to gravitational wave bursts. And again, they would show this very special angular correlation. So let me tell you about our gravitational wave results. Um, I'm gonna start back with our 11 year results because it's a really interesting story and one that Caltech played a very important role in actually. So whenever we do our gravitational wave analysis, we calculate a probability density function um, for a range of gravitational wave amplitudes. So this AGWB is the amplitude of the gravitational wave background. When we first looked at our 11 year data and searched for this common noise process, we calculated curves that look like these dotted lines here. Okay, both of these um, plots kind of show the same thing. This is in probability density and this is in Bayes factor. We can look at either one. Um, I'll stick to this one for now. So we saw PDFs, which looked like this. Um, and if you look at this, these are peaking at a particular value of the gravitational wave amplitude. We were very excited. This is what we would expect for a gravitational wave detection. We were seeing a common source of noise among all of the pulsars. If you look closely though, you'll see there are five different colors and each of those different colors is for a different solar system of femoris and they're, they're listed over here. Um, so obviously this is not good. Um, this shows that we get a different answer depending on which solar system ephemeris is used. Um, so what we did for the 11 year data set is we developed a new code 
it's called Bayes FM, and a lot of this development was done at Caltech um, that actually fits for the solar system ephemeris at the same time as it's fitting for the gravitational waves. So it's searching for this bipolar per perturbation um, at the same time as, it, as it's fitting for this quadrupolar gravitational wave perturbation. And when we use this Bayes FM code, um, we get these solid lines, these solid PDFs, and you can see that they are consistent um, with an upper limit, not with a strong detection um, of a common noise source. And you can see that most easily in this plot um, where the Bayes factor is about one um, for all of these uh, Bayes FM runs, um, which are all consistent regardless of which ephemeris we start with, which is really, really great. <laughs> so we didn't detect gravitational waves, um, but we developed a much more sophisticated analysis routine. And we also got a lot of experience in like figuring out what to do if we think we have a detection, right? We tried to make it go away and we could, um, and that is what we're going to do um, going forward as well. Um, so these are actually plots from a paper led by Michele Valisneri and, and a Caltech postdoc led this analysis, um, this detection analysis, Steve Taylor, who some of you might know. Okay, so even though we didn't detect, detect gravitational waves um, with that 11 year data set, um, oh, I better speed up a little bit. Um, even though we didn't detect gravitational waves, we could set a lot of astrophysical constraints, right? So we didn't make a detection, but these colored bands here show three different predictions um, for the spectrum of the gravitational wave background. And all three of these bands have different assumptions about the effects of stellar scattering, um, how much like gas in the disk around these black holes um, plays a role in their merging, um, whether the black holes are in circular or eccentric orbits. Um, and we can actually rule out one of these models, the most optimistic model, just given this upper limit. So we were already doing astrophysics with that 11 year limit. Um, we can look at different relationships for black hole to bulge mass. Um, here are some plotted on this diagram. And we can actually say that these relationships, this Quirman and Ho and McConnell and Ma relationship, which predict quite a large ratio of black hole to bulge mass are, are not very likely because we should have already detected gravitational waves um, if black holes were this large um, with respect to their, their galactic bulges. So we could do some neat astrophysics with that. Okay, now the most recent results. So our new data set is only a year and a half more um, of data from the 11 year. So not a ton more data um, and only three more pulsars. We didn't add many more pulsars either. Um, but on the left here, let me just show you what our actual Hellings and Downs curves look like. So this diagram shows the correlations that we get um, when we correlate the residuals of every pulsar with every other pulsar. Um, in reality, there are many, many, many points on this diagram, um, but these are binned just for ease of viewing. Um, but these you know, th this distribution is not what we actually analyze, right? We look at all of the correlations among all the pulsars. And the reason I'm showing this is just to show you that the R bars have gone down from the 11 to the 12 and a half year. So that is what we like to see. And um, the R bars are smaller. Um, we still do not see a clear Hellings and down trend by eye. So this blue dotted line um, is the best fit Hellings and downs curve to the data. Um, in both cases. And in both cases, the error bars on this best fit amplitude, we don't show them here, but they're consistent with zero. So this, these are upper limits. Um, but you can see that the error bars are getting smaller. Maybe if you're very optimistic, you can tell yourself they're starting to hug this, this curve a little more, um, but there's still some points that are kind of, kind of off the, the expected curve. Um, and the points here at large angular separations have quite high error bars. However, the very exciting thing about this 12 and a half year data set is that when we do the same analysis that we did on the 11 year data set, we get something that looks like this, right? So this shows the probability density um, versus gravitational wave amplitude. And these two curves are for a fixed solar system ephemeris. So this is using the most recent JPL ephemeris. Um, this one is from France, the IMPOP group in France. Um, they're completely consistent, which is nice. Um, if they're wrong, they're both wrong in exactly the same way, which seems unlikely. And these dotted curves are what we get from Bayes FM. Um, which are both completely consistent with each other. And all four of these peak at a particular value of the gravitational wave amplitude. This does not mean we've detected gravitational waves. Um, we cannot say that until we actually can distinguish this quadrupolar signature. What it does mean though, is that we found a very strong common red noise process among all the pulsars. It may be gravitational waves. It may be something else that we have yet to tease out, but this is very exciting. And for this reason, we can't really do any astrophysics with this new limit because we don't know what it is yet, right? So, and I said limit, it's not even a limit. It's a, it's a detection of a noise process. So we can't set an upper limit. Um, we can't do much astrophysics with it. We need to wait for our next data set and see whether this pans out to be a gravitational wave 
um, or something else. If it is a gravitational wave background, um, the amplitude sits at about this green horizontal line here. And what this shows is that in our next data set, our 15 year data set, we should detect that background with a signal to noise, something like four to seven um, in our 15 year data set. So that is very, very exciting. And we're starting to get into the regime where we'd be able to constrain the amplitude um, better and better as we get to longer and longer data sets. This is 20 years here um, and the spectrum better. And once we can measure that amplitude in the spectrum, we can start really using those numbers to place unique constraints on how galaxies have formed and evolved over cosmic time. Okay, so I just wanna spend just a couple minutes talking very briefly about our continuous rave results. So we think the stochastic background is the thing we're gonna detect first. Um, we think it's gonna be brighter than that of any single source, um, but not necessarily. We could get very lucky and live in a universe where there's a, a very nearby, very bright, supermassive black hole binary. Um, so we also search for continuous waves or single sources. Um, our sky average limit is higher than our stochastic background limit, um, and it's very direction dependent. Um, in some directions of the galaxy where we have a bunch of really good high timing precision pulsars, we can set um, very stringent limits. We can say there's no supermassive black hole binaries with, with billion solar mass masses out to 120 megaparsecs. In other regions, we can go to like 20 megaparsecs. So we have a very anisotropic um, distribution of, of sensitivity. But our limits are getting better with time. This shows the frequency dependent limit for the five, nine, and 11 year data set. And we can make statements like there are no binary supermassive black holes in the direction of Virgo um, with masses greater than about a billion solar masses. So that EHT black hole is, is very unlikely to be a binary, or we would have seen it in our data. Um, we also reached a very exciting milestone over the past year um, when we published our first electromagnetically informed continuous wave search. So there's a galaxy called 3C66b. Um, this is a very large array image of this galaxy, and it's purported to have a black hole binary um, at its core um, due to these this jet structure. And um, authors analyzing these, this VLA data um, have predicted what the mass of this system is. Um, that's this dotted orange line here. This orange band is their, their mass range. We have searched for this system in our data um, using their electromagnetic um, parameters as priors. Here's our 95% upper limit, um, and here's our posterior distribution. We can't rule out the mass that they um, predict yet, um, but we can start setting kind of reasonable limits on this mass. And within a few years, we should be in the regime where we can actually test um, whether the parameters of this black hole binary are correct, or, or maybe detect this black hole binary, of course, if their um, parameters are correct. So this is very exciting, and this kind of paves the way for a lot more multi-messenger astrophysics um, that we're gonna do in the future. I am gonna go through this one very quickly. This is the result of a, a simulation on galaxies detected by two mass, um, which basically shows that, you know, in some small number of simulations, we could expect to detect single sources now, um, but within about 10 years, we, we expect to make a blind detection um, of supermassive black hole binaries, individual ones. And then this might be quite conservative. It could be as soon as five years, just depending on what universe we live in. And I just wanted to point out that this is work done by a, a former Caltech postdoc named Chiara Mingarelli. And I don't think I explicitly stated, but Joe Simon, um, another former Caltech postdoc led our 12 and a half year analysis. So there's a lot of Caltech work that's gone into all of this stuff. And so finally, let me just end um, by talking about the future. Um, so how do we, increase the sensitivity of our experiment? You know, how do we get to detection faster? How do we get to characterization of the gravitational wave universe faster? It's pretty simple. Our signal to noise um, doesn't depend on a whole lot of stuff. And the things it does depend on are pretty predictable. Um, it depends on the number of millisecond pulsars. The more pulsars we have, the more sensitive we'll be. Um, the total time span of the experiment, um, the cadence of our experiment, so how frequently we observe um, and the um, precision with which we can observe. And don't take these numbers, this three over 26 or, or one half two, literally these kind of depend on the strength of the background with respect to the noise. And we're, we're not exactly sure what those are, um, but we know it's gonna get better with more pulsars, longer time spans, higher cadence and, and higher timing precision. So going forward, uh, one of our big goals is to get more millisecond pulsars in our array. Um, we'd really like to carry out pulsar surveys to get to something like 200 millisecond pulsars um, within a decade. Um, and this simulation over here um, shows what that would look like. We'd have a lot more even sky coverage over this Hellings and Downs curve. 
Um, it's really important that we have wideband receivers. So right now we can't observe ever more than a gigahertz, um, which is really limiting because we need to observe at two separate frequencies. Um, the Moore Foundation is funding a wideband receiver for the Green Bank Telescope, which will cover this whole range of radio frequency. And that's gonna dramatically increase our sensitivity and also increase the efficiency of our observations because we can just do one observation instead of two at each epoch. And um, we're working very hard right now to incorporate chime data. Um, the chime data is very um, complementary because it's taken every single day. So we have a data point every single day and it's at much lower frequency than our current data, which allows us to correct for these interstellar medium effects better. So we're, we're really excited to see what this data is gonna do for our sensitivity. And of course, going down the line, it is incredibly important. Um, well, now it's really important we replace Arecibo. Um, even before the Arecibo collapse, it was important that we found a telescope where we could get higher cadence observations of many more pulsars. Um, so we're very enthusiastic about contributing to the development of next generation arrays. We're, we're really excited about DSA 2000, um, the development of which is being led, of course, here at Caltech also. So we really hope that comes to pass because it's going to be absolutely necessary for us to have a new instrument for this next stage of characterizing the gravitational wave universe, you know, once we've made that initial detection. Okay, and I just wanted to also just come back to the IPTA. Um, I've talked just about our nanograv efforts in this talk, um, but the IPTA is incredibly important and we're working very hard to combine our data with data from all these other telescopes worldwide. And of course, this data set will be much more sensitive than the nanograv data set alone. Um, so we're, we're very excited for that. So um, this is just a summary slide. I think I might just like leave this up since I've kind of gone a little bit long. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for inviting me again. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm happy to, to meet with anyone or you know exchange emails with anyone who wants to get involved in Nanograv or learn more about what we're doing after this. So thanks. Thanks more, that was great. Um, okay, I wanna open it up to questions. Uh, Catherine, I see your hand is raised. Thank you. I was wondering, for pulsars that you can observe with multiple telescopes, is it better to uh, always observe, like to divide them up by telescope and assign certain ones to certain telescopes? Or do you use, a, is it better to have multiple telescopes observe the same pulsar? Both. <laughs> so what we've done with Nanograv is we have two pulsars um, that we really love, which are like excellent timers, really bright. Um, for the entirety of our experiment, we've observed two pulsars with both Arecibo and the GBT. Um, that's a really great consistency check. If there's some offset between the telescopes and we have data on the same pulsars with both, right? That's, that's super helpful. So we've lost that um, now that we've lost Arecibo. In general, we don't want to do that though for every pulsar because it would just be like, a we don't have enough telescope time. It'd be a waste of telescope time to do that for all of them. Um, so what we've done so far is every pulsar that we could see with Arecibo, we did with Arecibo. So everything with declinations between zero and 30 degrees, we did with Arecibo because it's always going to be more sensitive than Green Bank. All the rest of them we did with, with Green Bank. Um, now, of course, we're trying to add some of the Arecibo ones into the Green Bank schedule since we've lost Arecibo. Thank you. Okay, uh, Kishale. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I had a question about uh, the timing noise that you mentioned at some points in the talk. So could you talk a bit about sort of the frontier with regards to understanding the emission properties of individual pulsars that might help in this, you know, understanding this detection process better? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the timing noise that we talk about um, is due to like angular momentum transfer from a super fluid core, you know, to the crust of the neutron star. Um, sometimes we see that as like discrete glitches, um, but in nanograv, we've never observed one of those so far. Um, so the noise is sort of just low frequency red noise that looks much like a gravitational wave. Um, the only difference is that it is not spatially correlated. So when we do our analysis, we search for low frequency noise that's correlated and low frequency noise that's, that's uncorrelated. As far as your question goes, I think there's two kind of ends of this, like, on the one hand, we're learning a lot about timing noise um, from the work that Nanograv's doing um, from our analysis. On the other hand, one thing that I've been doing a lot of actually with my group here at WVU is trying to characterize noise through other methods that, that aren't like in our gravitational wave pipeline. Um, so we can kind of, if we do measure noise properties and we have a gravitational wave detection, 
Um, we can reassure the community by saying like, yes, we measure these noise properties and we measure these gravitational waves, and we can verify that these noise properties are as we expect because we've also measured them in this totally other way um, with complementary data. So we're doing a lot of like single pulse studies um, of millisecond pulsars, which, which we don't observe for nanograv, we don't get single pulses, um, but we can use those single pulse studies to do things like characterize you know, jitter um, and make sure it matches up with what we attribute to jitter in the nanograv data. Does that make sense? Thank you. I'll uh, interject with a question. I can't raise my hand, I think, as a host, but um, with our SIBO offline, um, which is obviously uh, uh, terrible, but um, there's, the, there's loss of sensitivity. Um, when, when you pick those pulses back up, either with BLA or more wideband GPT, or in the, in the cases of the, the fainter ones, the future arrays, um, apart from the loss of sensitivity, is there any impact of that window function where you've got this large gap uh, in the data uh, of a few yeah. years? I mean, for sure there is. I mean, so if we have a like three year gap in the data, um, that kind of, it's, it's really gonna impact that higher frequency sensitivity, right? Like at periods of like three years or so, um, we're, we're gonna have artifacts in our data due, due to that gap in sampling. Um, it'll impact our low frequency sensitivity too, but not quite as much. The, the main problem is that, um, you know, we'll start, we'll lose being able to track the short time scale stuff like binary orbits um, and to some extent like proper motions and positions if we have a gap more than say a year or so. Um, so for some pulsars, we may just need to fit what we call like a jump um, in between the old data and the new data. And then we can just continue to carry on. Um, but obviously if we fit like a, a jump between data sets um, we're just not sensitive to anything that's happened in that time span, like between those two data sets. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like, I was wondering. I was wondering if there was, you know, some sort of sampling function that you have to try to, you know, solve for to make sure you've you've minimized the, the artifacts that you get from uh, from being offline. So yeah, you know. I think that's exactly right. I mean, that's that's exactly what we have to do. Um, and by the way, we haven't given up on trying to get all the Arecibo pulsars timed, and we're working with people at Fast. Um, you know, with the FAST telescope in China um, to see if we can get some of those pulsars into their observing schedule. Because it's really the only telescope that's big enough um, to cover some of the pulsars. Some of them are just too faint um, for the GBT. So, so I hope maybe within six months, like we'll have all those pulsars being timed um, with some telescope. I really hope so. Okay, great. A uh, question from Wen Bin Liu. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a question on the chime data. So the, does the chime utilize its entire uh, collecting area for a, for a given pulsar, or is just the those a kind of the mult the mult? I don't understand the, how the multi beam uh, works for the chime. Could you kind of uh, educate me on how chime collects? Yeah, I mean, I compared to HBT or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on the chime at all. I haven't been any part of its like development or building, and I'm not a I'm not a radio instrumentation person. Um, but my understanding is it uses it uses most of the collecting area for a particular pulsar, but it's a drift scan telescope, so it can't like track a source. Um, it can form multiple beams um, on a particular pulsar. I don't know what fraction of the collecting area is illuminated. I mean, it'll it'll depend on the direction of the pulsar in the sky or whatever. Um, but for each of our pulsars, we'd get something like five to 15 minutes of observation as the pulsar drifts overhead. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, a drift telescope. I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. Yeah, I see. So the exposure time is not very large. Exposure uh, time is not nearly as large yeah. as with our nanograph. Well, it depends on the pulsar. It depends on the declination of mm -hmm. the pulsar. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's not typically going to be as large as our nanograph observations. But the observations are every single day, and the bandwidth is pretty big. It's 400 megahertz, um, so it ends up contributing to the sensitivity fairly significantly, especially for solving for these dispersion measures, um, which are much more dominant effects at low frequency. So we can measure them much better in this 400 to 800 megahertz band. And I wish I could say more about Chime, but we I haven't yet combined the data with Nanograv. We're in the process of doing it now, so I can't say 
like by how much um, it impacts our sensitivity because we, we just don't know yet. We're still working on it. Thanks so much. I'd be curious to see how the beam affects the, 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 the knowledge beam, the primary beam affects the, the timing overall. Um, we have one last question. We're up against the hour here, but um, uh, Ranga. Yeah, um, I was a little bit puzzled, or maybe you said this and I didn't understand it, but what constraints do you have on directionality of the signal? So for example, for 3C66, where you think there's a supermassive black hole binary, I mean, do you know for certain that you would be able if you saw something that it is definitively associated with 3C66 versus something which is slightly further or nearby or what, yeah. so how, how well can you constrain directionality? And yeah. I didn't sure. mention it at all. So you okay. didn't miss anything. Um, for the specific case of 3C66B, we did not try to constrain directionality. Um, we set the position of that source. Um, we fixed that in our analysis. Um, which makes us much more sensitive, right? So if we know a particular source and we know its position, we just fix that in our analysis. And so that's not an issue for an electromagnetically identified source. For a blind um, continuous wave detection, um, our dire directionality will be very, very poor at first, um, much worse than, than LIGO, um, you know, many, many, many square degrees. Um, and the thing that limits our directionality is I mentioned before, we have this like earth term and this pulsar term to the perturbation. And right now we can really only use the earth term. And the reason for that is that we don't know the distances to the pulsars well enough. So if we wanna really start to localize gravitational wave sources very precisely. We need to know the distances to our pulsars within a gravitational wave wavelength, right? Which is like to parsecs um, or less than a parsec even in, in most cases. Um, and so if we, and we just don't know the distances well enough, <laughs> um, but we're measuring them better and better, both through timing um, and through VLBI. Um, and there's one pulsar now where I think we know the distance well enough to use that term um, in the, the solution. So once we know the distances to the pulsars well enough, then we can really start to localize the source very well. It's, it's kind of akin to having like, you know, multiple uh, ground-based gravitational wave detectors um, but you need to know exactly where they are <laughs> um, on the earth in order to do the directionality experiment. And we need to know exactly where our pulsars are. And we, we don't know that well enough yet. Thank you. Very interesting. All right. So I want to thank Bob Moore again for a wonderful colloquium and for staying around to answer our questions. So thank you very much. And I think we're going to have uh, uh, a little uh, meet and greet with the faculty. Um, but um, uh, we'll let everybody else stream out first. So. Uh, Thanks more, just hang around for a minute or two.